Hello, my name is Andy, and I am the village idiot, and a mom with a car and a GoPro, and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. Welcome back to the district of Bassett Law, and today we're in a parish which is named after a priory, but that doesn't really tell you the whole story because this country park and the village that goes with it do not fall anywhere close to the priory. They're to the northwest. Today, though, we're looking at the parish of Hodsock. Today we're in Hodsock, and if you're from Nottinghamshire, Bassett Law, or even just Worksop, that's a name you will almost certainly know thanks to an historic building. We get to it by crossing a narrow bridge over a stream. The name Hodsock means Hod's Oak Tree. Where that tree is, or indeed was, I have no idea. But these days, this building is what most people will associate with the name. Hodsock Priory is a very popular wedding venue situated in a huge parkland to the north of Worksop, but through history it's been far more than that. Hodsock has been occupied since at least the Bronze Age, and there's also some evidence of Roman and Saxon occupation that's been found in the gardens. The Cressy family, who owned Hodsock from the mid-12th century for more than 200 years, were powerful enough to entertain kings of England, Henry II, John and Edward I. The Clifton family took over the estate at the beginning of the 15th century and owned it through 14 generations to 1765. The Tudor Gatehouse was built in the early 16th century by Sir Gervais Clifton, who was the favourite of successive Tudor monarchs. Queen Elizabeth I referred to him as Gervais the Gentle, and Henry VIII visited him here at Hodsuck Priory in the summer of 1541 to bestow upon him his knighthood. It's possible it's for that reason that the gatehouse was built. Clifton would sell the estate to William and his son Charles Mellish of Blythe Hall, which was nearby. When Charles Mellish died in 1797, his son Henry Francis Mellish inherited both Blythe Hall and Hodsock Priory. Henry Francis Mellish was the second son of Charles Mellish and therefore not normally the heir. However, his elder brother Joseph was disinherited because of his extravagance and gambling. Henry proved to be of similar character, and by 1806 he was obliged to sell Blythe Hall to pay his gambling debts. Hodsock Priory then became the main residence of the Mellish family. So filming Hodsock Priory came with uh, a couple of conditions. Um, I'm basically only allowed to go uh, around the, the main buildings, which is this sort of courtyard area and these gardens. Uh, I am allowed to come down here as well uh, towards the uh, little lake, which we're going to go and get a shot of in a moment. And uh, the other condition I had was uh, the snowdrops, which you can see here. This is what Hodsock Priory is known for. It's known for the snowdrops, but it's usually open to the public in February so that people can come and see them. However, this year is the first year in 30 years where it's not going to be open to the public. Over time and through some seemingly complicated sales and inheritances, Hodsock would come to the Buchanan family. In 1991, Sir Andrew Buchanan was appointed Lord Lieutenant of Nottinghamshire. The house is now owned by George and Catherine Buchanan. Despite its name, it's not and never has been a priory. Hodsock was recorded in the Doomsday Book as Odesack and was formerly a lordship in the parish of Blythe. In 1866, Hodsock became a civil parish in its own right. The priory and gardens are at the centre of the 800 acre estate, which has been owned by both the Mellishes and the Buchanan families since 1765. The farm is 700 acres and grows carrots, wheat, barley and sugar beet. There's 100 acres of managed woodland. 
The gardens at Hodsock were developed in the first half of the 20th century under the guidance of head gardener Arthur Ford. Ford regularly wrote articles for gardening magazines and was reputedly headhunted by Kew Gardens. This is pretty cool. In the grounds of the Priory we have a little bench here that says Worksop District to commemorate a hundred years of scouting. The snowdrops at Hodsock Priory are a major attraction and normally in February the gardens are opened up to the public. However, Sir Andrew and Lady Buchanan have recently retired, aged 84. As such, I was asked to not focus on the snowdrops whilst I was here in order to ensure that the public do not get the wrongful impression that the house is open this year. Here's some more information about Hodsock Priory though. It has a 20 million gallon irrigation reservoir constructed in 1997, which covers seven and a half acres and is carefully designed to blend in with the landscape. The reservoir attracts wild waterfowl, including oyster catchers, great crested greaves, and common shell ducks. Elsewhere on the estate, there are all kinds of bird life, including owls, kingfishers, kestrels, and green woodpeckers. And here's a fun fact for you too. The first human condoms were devised at Hostock House in 1558. This would lead to the first documented production in 1564 by the anatomist Gabrielle Fallopio. So as well as the Priory, there are a couple of houses here as well in the distance over there. Now I haven't been given permission to go over there, uh, so I assume that I can't. Uh, but that's not a problem because I think the main part of Hodsock is obviously always going to be that, always going to be the Priory. So yeah, that is Hodsock Priory. Now this is a parish that's got a, a population well over 2,000 people. And they certainly all don't live here at Hodsock because as you can see, it's surrounded by <laughs> parkland and they certainly don't all live in those houses and they certainly don't live in there. So where do they all live? Well, I'll tell you where they live. They live in a place called Langold, which is the main village in this parish of Bassetlaw. And that's where we're going right now. Langold is the main village in the civil parish of Hodsock. At the 2011 census, despite being in Hodsock, it was Langold itself that was defined as a ward of Bassett Law Council. It was built to provide housing for the miners of Furbeck Colliery between 1923 and 1927. Langold Lakes Country Park is situated on the southwestern edge of the village, which was originally designed as a recreational area for the mine workers. So uh, humorous, uh, it's just occurred to me that the route I'm following is taking me the wrong way down all the one-way streets. <laughs> Thankfully, a pedestrian can't get done for that. While there are references to settlement in the geographical area which is now Langold from 1246, before the early 20th century it consisted primarily of farmland and parkland in the estates of both Furbeck and Hodsock. Whilst the Mellish family owned Hodsock Priory, its estate and its farms and much of Carlton in Lindrick, part of the land was sold to Ralph Knight of Langold. The Mellish name is seen within the village, alluding to the area's history. By 1911, mining in the area suggested that there may be a workable seam of coal at Langold. The Walling Wells Boring Company was created and German engineers carried out some test drilling in a field which was part of Costhorpe Farm. Uh, it's been a while hasn't it since we've seen an estate like this, a village like this that's, that's uh, obviously a model village built for mining and with wide footpaths. The last time we saw one of these in Bassett Law I believe was in Harworth and Burcoats. Uh, so yeah it's been a while since we've seen one like this. It would take some time before Langold was built. Although the initial tests were good, the First World War brought a stop to the work. The Furbeck Light Railway was authorised in 1916, but no further development took place until 1923. 
access to the colliery site was provided by around five miles of temporary railway track laid to connect the main railway network which served Harworth Colliery and some of the remains of this we'll see in Langold Country Park later. As for Langold itself, it would spring up rather quickly and all the houses here are built in the same model village style we're accustomed to seeing. Construction of housing began to the west of the main road in 1924 with 128 houses completed and occupied by April 1925. In less than five years, a village consisting of 850 houses, six shops and a school had been built to house the workers, many of whom were brought from the coal mining areas of the northeast of England. These days, Langold accounts for almost all of Hodsock Parish's population. That's a population that's 99.2% white British. Most of Hodsock's area, 16.51 square kilometers, is agricultural or parkland, so the density is low at 158.5. The average house in Langold will cost you 144,000 pounds. Langold has loads of amenities, in fact probably way more than you'd expect from a village this size. It's almost like a small town. Kicking things off we have the West Bassett Law Children's Centre. This is just a stone's throw away from the local school, Langold Discar Community School, another member of the Shine Multi Academy Trust. All you fans of allotments, Langold has some, they're right here. Langold has a very large open green space and recreational area besides the country park. That would be Harrison Drive football pitches. This is where Langold Juniors Football Club play, members of the Sheffield and District Junior Sunday League. Certainly well served on the football fronts, isn't it, Langold? Langold Juniors FC and uh, Langold uh, Old Boys as well is uh, another name I saw on one of those uh, shipping containers. A car park for it here. Bus-wise, it's the same story here as it was in Carlton and Lindrig. You catch the 22 bus in the village between Worksop and Doncaster. Shops and stalls started to appear almost as soon as people moved into the village, selling provisions to those sinking the colliery shafts. Many of the shops were built on the eastern side of Doncaster Road, although there were others scattered throughout the village too. The Worksop Cooperative Society arrived in 1925 and their large shop had an upstairs room which was used as a schoolroom and Sunday school during the day and also as a dance hall at night. Two banks operated part-time in the village and two cinemas opened in 1927. Some of those old buildings still remain, whilst others have since been redesigned or perhaps demolished. One thing's for sure, Langold certainly still has plenty. Good to see a small village like this with a, a nice healthy row of shops. The amount of times we see villages like this, about this size, that don't have all these shops, all these amenities, it's great to see them going still. Langold Village Hall is the location of the Hodsock Parish office. It's the largest communal space both in the village and the parish and can be hired for several types of event. One thing Langold does seem to lack is a pub. However, it does have two clubs, this one being the Royal British Legion Club. And there's also a working men's club too, Hilltop Working Men's Club. Do let me know, Langolders, if there are any pubs here. Over the road from where I'm standing here, there's a small library as well as a clinic behind it down the side road. On the A60, nestled in between the various shops, you'll find a religious building. This is the Hope Church. The main church is that of St Luke's on Church Street. Of particular note is the foundation stone which is inscribed To the glory of God, this stone was laid by Miss Mellish, 25th of June 1928. This is right next door to Langold's surgery, close enough that I could get both buildings in one shot. Outside the Royal British Legion Club, you'll come across Langold Cenotaph. That's not the only memorial of note here. Here is Langold's memorial to the 60 miners who died during the operational years of Furbeck Colliery. 
Like so many other local pits, the mine produced coal for the industrial market. Some 1,457 underground workers and 357 surface workers were employed here. So as well as uh, Furbeck, Maine, there's a mention here of some other collieries we've seen. Bevercoats, Cresswell, Langwith, Maltby, Shire Oaks, and Steetley. After nationalisation in 1946, Furbeck became part of the National Coal Board's number one workshop area. Problems gradually occurred as the mine was affected by water, ventilation difficulties and geological faults. Transport of the coal to the surface was slow as the shafts were unsuitable for the installation of mechanical skip winding and by 1968 the mine was deemed to be uneconomical. It closed on the 31st of December and many of the miners moved to other local pits at Maltby, Manton, Shire Oaks and Steetley. Okay, for the last part of the episode today I've come to Langol Country Park and I've enlisted the help of a local. Say hello everybody to a long time fan of the channel, Mr. Matt Driver. Hello guys. Now Matt knows this place a lot better than I do and he knows all the historical uh, locations and landmarks in Langol Country Park. So let's have a little walk with him and see what we can find. Langol Country Park's history is quite storied. It was once parkland belonging to Langold Hall, but was purchased by the Furbeck Colliery Company in 1927. The result is that now some of the land here is full of the remnants of those coal mining and railway days. So what are we looking at here, Matt? This is one of the old embankments for the Furbeck branch line. If you walk up here, you'll be able to see how it, how it stretches. So where did this go? Um, from what I understand, um, the portal is back over towards the miners' welfare. It would then swerve, swerve round or sort of parallel to the road and head towards Arworth, Burcoats and Maltby. Right. We've seen all of those before, guys. It's all linked together, all these colliery places are all linked together with railway lines. It's amazing how many there actually are, or were. As a workshop native, Matt knew exactly where to locate the things that give away what this area used to be used for. So I posted a picture of the portal which is just in the distance and when I actually researched it, all this area off the Rail Maps Online website showed all this to be old sidings for the old mines. These are old railway sidings and the old sidings walk is even marked on the information boards you can find here. However, it won't tell you where to find some of the interesting stuff. Right, so apparently this is the cutting where the railway would have come through here and this is all the sidings. And we're heading towards that portal across this little skate park. Oh, I wonder whether in times gone by the people that would uh, use these railway lines would know there'd be a skate park built on it in years to come. <laughs> the portal is a little hard to get to. It's now filled in and obscured by some fallen trees. This took some doing to get under these branches. At one time, the railway line ran under the road. Right, so there's the start of the portal all infilled. In fact, you can see at the top, can't you? There's yeah. like a, the top of a bridge. Yep. Yep. Yeah, original blue brick. Yeah. So there's the road up there. So if you drive through Langold, you'll actually drive over this without even realizing that you're driving over an old railway line. Now there it is. What's next, Matt? We're gonna go for the, um... that's a good question. <laughs> trying to think of name, what we call again now. Culvert is the word he was after. That's gone. Well, actually, it was my daughter who caught this on one of his bike rides. And as you can see, we've got the embankment above. And then we see this elaborate brickwork here, which actually happens to be a culvert uh, for, I believe, to be some sort of spring, which leads out towards Hobsock. It was a little muddy, but here is the culvert. Here we go. Fabulous Victorian brickwork. So we're coming towards a bridge now. What's special about this bridge, Matt? It's a connection. I can't say categorically it is this, but obviously everything we've found up to is rail related in regards to landmarks. And this uh, little bridge that's been made for the public, it's actually made out of railway sleepers. That is fascinating. You don't see this every day. 
I thought this was a nice touch given the park has plenty of railway related history, and it's not the kind of thing you would instantaneously notice either. If you look closely, you can see where the rails would have been connected. That brings us to the lakes. The initial existence of these is down to that man, Ralph Knight, converting the existing ponds here into two interconnected lakes, for which the work was completed in 1818. So one for the Langold locals. Matt says that at some point in the past, Langold Lake had a diving board. Does anybody remember the diving board? We walked as far as the old bandstand before heading back. At this point, I should mention that the western half of Langold Country Park is actually within Carlton and Lindrick's boundaries. So Matt's now gone uh, back off to Worksop and I'm going the other way because there's one other thing I need to catch in the parish of Hodsock. And it's something that he didn't even know about. And I wonder how many people local to Hodsock and Langold know about this. I'm going to suggest it's probably not very many. Anyway, before we get to that, here's today's picture bit. Okay, now to finish off, you might recognise where I am here. This is Old Coats. If you remember the Stirrup with Old Coats episode, you remember me walking down there to the church on the corner? Well, I'm heading the other way here. You might remember me saying in that episode, some of these buildings in this direction belong to Hodsock Parish because the boundary is this here. This uh, stream, which I've forgotten the name of. Um, is the boundary between Stirrup and Oldcoats and Hodsock. And interestingly, the first property that you can see heading this way, heading south towards Worksop, is the property that we're coming to see. The parish possibly included the deserted medieval village of Hermiston. Though its location is not known, nor is it known if it was one, it was referred to in historical texts, and it was likely to be close to, and possibly north of, the present day Hermiston Hall. Hermiston Hall is situated on a site where a previous manor stood, built around 1100 AD for the Cress family who lived there until 1408. Bess of Hardwick was known to have been connected to the property in the 16th century. A Roman road runs through the land here. You may recall a mention of a nearby Roman villa in the Stirrup with Oldcoats episode. After the English Civil War, the property fell into decline and from 1765 the area fell under the ownership of guess who, the Mellish family. The hall as it stands today was created in 1848 by Edward Challoner, a timber importer from Liverpool. It contains part of an older 16th century abbey on the rear side which was owned by the Riddle family. At one stage it was being marketed as a hotel but now it's residential. Well, that's a very interesting way to finish isn't it? Hermiston Hall, often missed on the A60. Not a lot of people know it's there, so I'm glad I've got this in, in the Hot Sock episode. Right, time for me to move on to my next parish in Bassilor. We've only got eight left now, so uh, we're getting very close to the end of the first district in Nottinghamshire. This has been the parish of Hodsock, and I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.